Today on Mr. Media, I'll talk to John Fricke, author of a new coffee table filmography, Judy, a legendary film career. Stick around. We're going to see how many of you knew that the Judy in the book's title is Judy Garland. Ah, oh, damn. There, there was going to be a test later. Well, we all better get A's. So much media, so little time. Who keeps track of it all? That would be me. This is Bob Andelman, and this is a Mr. Media interview. You know, MrMedia.com, MRMedia.com. Stop by and check it out. There are more than 900 archives, celebrity, and pop culture interviews for your listening pleasure. Mr. Media is recorded live before a studio audience of former gay icons who refuse to acknowledge their fabulosity in this world or the next in the new new media capital of the world, St. Petersburg, Florida. Clang, clang, clang went the trolley. Ding, ding, ding went the bell. Zing, zing, zing went my heart strings. From the moment I saw him, I fell. Meet Me in St. Louis is the tender, romantic story of the most popular young beauty of the early 1900s, of her crush on the boy next door. Of her lovable, yet at times humorous family. If you like a bean like I like you, and we like a bone the same. Pantheon of movie stars who will live forever in the memories of cinema fans, few burn brighter than Judy Garland. She lived a well-documented life of extraordinariness from her big screen breakthrough in The Wizard of Oz on through A Star is Born and Meet Me in St. Louis. There was no medium she couldn't conquer, whether it was movies, radio, or later, television. Wherever she went, whatever she did... She was universally respected for her God-given talent and adored for her smile and spunk. Uh, there have been, of course, entire bookshelves of research and publications devoted to the magic of Garland, and it could be argued that what the world didn't need was another coffee table book of pictures and facts about the actress who brought Dorothy Gale to life in 1939. But biographer John Fricke, who also wrote The Wizard of Oz, an illustrated companion to the timeless movie classic, knows his subject better than most and found a fresh way to present his case for another print celebration of her life and art. Judy, a legendary film career, breaks down the movies of the actress and singer into four parts of her life. It then entertains the reader with synopses, cast lists, behind-the-scenes credits, musical numbers when appropriate, and photos. Lots and lots of great photos. If you love Judy Garland, you'll love this book. John Fricke, welcome to Mr. Media. That's one of the best introductions and best summations of, of her career I think I've ever heard, Bob. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Can I write your next book? <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, and then I'll take over your job, and I have a feeling one of us is going to be doing better financially than the other. Uh, probably you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, then we're both in trouble. I, I, and I love the, the thing at the top of the show, too, about which Judy's had the legendary film career. I was thinking, Judy Canova, Judy Collins, you know, how many other Judys have there been in, in movie history? Well, that's why we've got to keep the audience on their toes. Well, that's fine. <laughs> so, now, I hope you didn't take any offense, but why did the world need another book about Judy Garland? I mean, were all the other ones sold out? 
Well, that's part of it, including <laughs> the, the previous uh, five I've written on Oz and Judy one way or another. I think, I think it's just that uh, there's always a new generation, and books, of course, do go out of print. Judy, I think more than most Hollywood celebrities, uh, has fallen victim over the decades to a lot of misreportage and misinformation. I think part of the problem is that in many of the biographies and even many of the career analyses that have been done since she died in 1969, a lot of them were written in the immediate decade or so afterwards when a lot of people were still alive, uh, husbands, managers, uh, directors, studio heads, and you had to tread very carefully. You could say she did this and this and this, but if the facts in some of those cases weren't especially appealing, you couldn't say why, because the reasons uh, for, the, for any kind of misbehavior were still out there and litigious. So I think one of the reasons that it was nice to do this book, not only to celebrate a film career that went from uh, 1929 to 1963, but uh, a, a film career that was successful then that has proved to be timeless, not because I say so, but because the fans still line up, and because you could put things into a little bit more perspective now. And as a fan, there are literally thousands of photographs of Judy Garland in books. There are thousands more that still have not been in books, and people enjoy looking at that. So one of the goals for this book was to get the facts straight uh, get the summaries straight about her life and times and work, and to provide another 500-some photographs that haven't been in, in prior books. You stopped me dead there. Let me go back a second. You said there are thousands more photos of Judy Garland that have not been in books. Is that oh, possible? easily. Easily. Yes, definitely. I mean, uh, we edited down the 550 in this book from about... Oh, maybe 1,500, which were our, our, our final choices for the project. And to get down to the 1,500, we probably looked at three or 4,000. I'm just, I mean, consider my <laughs> mind blown because, I mean, as, you know, I mean, she's, she's been gone for decades. There have been yeah, she books. Hasn't posed and, lately. Uh, yeah, I mean, how is it that, that there are that many, fo- I mean, I know she was photographed like crazy in her career, um, but. There are thousands of, I mean, it just, it blows my mind. Well, and those are the ones that are extant. You know, you figure they probably took, uh, what, 1,500 shots, stills, of every film she made, of all 34 feature films, say. And uh, then they circulated maybe 300 uh, of those. And even if, uh, the only, I will say this, the only film for which it's difficult to find previously unpublished art is Wizard of Oz, because of course that has been, you know, had its own history and its own series of books. Mm -hmm. Um, But somebody turned up on the internet just this week a beautiful picture of her on the set of The Wizard of Oz that none of us had ever seen before. So the material is out there. It's just a question of digging, and I've been very fortunate in that uh, the preceding work, um, the first book I did that related to Judy was published 22 years ago. Wow. And the, this is the sixth uh, across those two decades plus. And one of the, the nicest things is that the books have been well received by the people who admire and respect her, so that the other fans and collectors who are on that plane have come to me and said, whatever I have, you can use for a future project. And that's what makes mm-hmm. something like this possible it's the generosity of a, and the cooperation of a lot of people and you're saying that there are f- 515 photos in this book that have not been seen before i, I think i think there are probably uh, there are 550 altogether 50. and Pardon i me. think um perhaps <laughs> 50 of them uh are, are redos again because it's difficult to find things about oz that uh, haven't been used before none of the oz photos have been used in any of my preceding garland projects i might have used them in an oz project a couple decades ago, um, now out of print. Um, but again, that that is the approach. You and there are some that are from Garland books or that were used in Garland books in 1975, but that's a long time ago now. And they're worth if they're really good pictures and really rare pictures, they're worth bringing up again or making the most of again. Also, uh, with no reflection on the publishing industry. A lot of those books in the 70s weren't printed on this kind of stock. The reproductions of the photos weren't especially uh, special. Mm. And in this case, Running Press has done just a beautiful, beautiful job of bookmaking. The design is 
is extraordinary and welcoming and exciting. And not that I'm prejudiced, but I didn't have anything to do with the design of this <laughs> book. This was all done uh, by someone they selected. And uh, so it's very nice for an author to turn over all this material and have it turn out as well as it did. But a, a great gal named Susan Van Horn put all of this together from the copy and the artwork. And so, again, I would say 500 pictures that haven't been in a Garland book prior to this and another 50 that haven't been around for a long time. Well, and, and to give credit where credit is due, I don't usually talk about publishers, but this is definitely a specialty of running press. They do this type of book extremely well. Um, I, I just saw their uh, new uh, book on uh, Lucille Ball and Lucy and, and about the I Love Lucy series, and it's an astonishing book. It's in, in very much the same spirit of this. It's kind of chronological, and the photos that you see, are, it's kind of mind-blowing, uh, the photos in that book. and They just seem to do this very well. Well, I think it's, it's something that the, in which they believe. Uh, they've done Lucy at the movies. They've done Lana Turner. They've done Betty Davis, Frank Sinatra, uh, Judy. I believe they have Liz Taylor coming later this year. And it's kind of a reminder of the fact that show business didn't start with Justin and Brittany, you know? And I think for some of us, that's a very welcome reminder. Now, tell me a little bit about um, how you got started on this path. I mean, how many Judy and or Wizard books have you done now? Three on Oz and three on Garland uh, in the last 22 years, plus uh, documentaries uh, that I've co-produced or co-written, the... uh, that have been very well received. Uh, the PBS American Masters program on Garland in 2004 won Emmys. The a e Biography special on Judy in 1997 won the Emmy. Uh, CDs for uh, Savoy Jazz and Capital and uh, Sony Special Products, uh, the, the DVD commentary tracks and special features. Uh, it, it is amazing to have a hobby that starts when you're five evolve into a career some uh, three decades after that. But it was when I was in my late 30s that this started to coalesce. And, and I'm 60 now, and it's kind of like, well, I hope I go for another 30 or 40 years because i got a lot more Garland books to share. Well, Isn't uh, that a frightening thing? Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll have to write a new intro sometime down the line. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, How do you get started on this particular – is it an obsession? Is it a career opportunity? How, how do you explain it? I think I think it's a passion more than anything else because I think you know, given the work you do, that we don't choose these things; they kind of choose us. Hmm. And uh, if it's something you love to do, uh, you just find yourself in the middle of it. I started as a fan at age five with Wizard of Oz, uh, first network telecast back in 1956, and uh, I was I, I love music already at that age and uh, musical movies, but at age five, my big heroes were Walt Disney's Three Little Pigs, so to make the quantum leap to <laughs> Dorothy and Company was, was kind of a jump. But I, it was just, I think, kind of meant to be, because we all, a bunch of people in our family watched the movie that night, and they had a nice evening, and I walked away permanently scarred, <laughs> uh, but in a very nice way. And the enthusiasm I had for things already at that point in my life just really poured over when it came to that film. And my parents loved music and loved film, and uh, so they encouraged me. It wasn't, you know, but a few weeks later that I found out that Judy Garland had record albums, that there was an Oz record album, that there was an Oz storybook, and that led to finding out that there was a series of 40 official Oz books published between uh, 1900 and um, ultimately the last one was 1963, mm-hmm. uh, that Judy had made other movies that were on the Milwaukee Late Show. I grew up in Wisconsin. <laughs> And by the time I was 10 and she was playing Carnegie Hall and making that last huge comeback in the early 60s with um, uh, Judgment at Nuremberg and the Academy Award nomination and some other films and her TV specials and her TV series and her concerts, uh, I, was, I was thoroughly sold on all of this and uh, researched and collected for my own pleasure. And even at that age, it was like I wanted to know the backstory of the films and the concerts and the TV shows. I wasn't... Uh, obsessed with her private life i wanted it was the work that interested me the achievement and as i say it's never it was never supposed to become a career but i've been very lucky um, i had a, a background in journalism i went to northwestern university for college on a journalism scholarship so writing was something i'd always done and researching her and the wizard of oz was something i'd always done and I sang full time for many years in the uh, late from the mid 70s to the uh, early 90s, but 
that kind of all took a back seat when the writing and the producing and speaking careers took off. I guess it was about a decade ago when I woke up one morning and I thought, well, obviously, John, this is what you're supposed to be doing with your life because it's what you're doing. <laughs> and it's nice that people have found me um, capable of it. You know, I think there are a lot of people who would uh, like to be doing some of the stuff that that you do and that I do. And what we were lucky is that we were given the opportunities and then we had... Um, some kind of ability to see them through and to make them palatable to other people. Because if, you know, if we're not being entertaining, there's not much point in doing this in whatever media we express ourselves. And, and now so, you can print up this section of the uh, conversation to distribute it to shut-ins for inspirational <laughs> Well, I, what I'm wondering, John, is, I mean, is this, is this uh, do you make a living from, from covering and dealing with Judy Garland or you do something else? It's a life, but it's not a living. Let's okay. just leave it at that. <laughs> All right. But this is exclusively what you do? Well, yeah, more or less. I mean, I'm, I'm heading for um, the annual Wizard of Oz Festival in Indiana uh, in September, the annual Wizard of Oz Festival in Kansas in October. I've already done them in her hometown in Minnesota in June and in upstate New York, the home of Frank Baum, the author of The Wizard of Oz. That was in June as well. So I do four of those a year, uh, as a rule, uh, lecturing and emceeing and, and presenting. And then there are other, you know, opportunities. We just finished a, a remark. It was so exciting. A four weeks, uh, it was called the Summer of Judy in New York, which is where I make my home. And um, the Film Society of Lincoln Center showed 31 of her 34 films uh, in uh, 54 different screenings. The Paley Center, which is the Museum of Television and Radio, showed between 40 and 50 of her TV appearances across 22 screenings. Mm -hmm. And I was the MC and the host and the Q&A guy for all of that. And again, the, the, we, it's a line that we use in the text of the new, the new Judy film book. But uh, again, the age range of the audiences was from fetal to fatal. You <laughs> had kids of five or six who weren't just there to see Wizard of Oz. They were there to see... Judy and Gene Kelly in Summer Stock. They were there to see Meet Me in St. Louis. Um, and the people who came to the Paley Center, I think, were even more impressed because the movies are kind of familiar. But to find out that Judy Garland, as Judy Garland on TV, singing, talking, joking, whatever, was infinitely more interesting than any of the movie characters was, was a revelation to a lot of them. Hmm. But, um, you know, so it, it, my work involves all of that kind of stuff. It, it, it is... Um, it's not a, a, a lucrative field, certainly, um, but it is a. It's wonderful to wake up in the morning and, and know that you're going to enjoy what it is you're being asked to do. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. I, I, I can't say much more than that without getting the internal revenue involved. <laughs> no, I, I hear you. Uh, I, I want to go back to the uh, beginning of our conversation, though. There was one other thing you said. Uh, uh, after hello, that I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, <laughs> I thought was interesting because uh, I was asking you, and I was sort of teasing about you know the need for yet another uh, book about Judy or her career, and you made a point that I thought was really interesting, and and it bears going back to. You said that a lot of the books that were done before were done when people she worked with, or 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 even uh, herself, I guess, were alive, and so things are said in that setting. Uh, and I know this from 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 writing nonfiction and writing biography. Uh, things are sometimes said when people are still alive that are different than they will say after they are gone. And you know, you said basically, you almost you almost need another round of historians to go back and clean up uh, a bit of history in that situation. I think that's what you're saying. Well, more or less. I think I, you you have to expand on that though, because I think that you know most people have when she was alive, after she died, did nothing but rave about her as a human being and as a performer. Uh -huh. But we know that there were a lot of peaks and valleys in, in Judy's 47 years. And a lot of the valleys uh, were never explained in these books because the people responsible for the valleys were still alive. Uh -huh. And so they could be very you know, self-aggrandizing and offhand about, oh, well, Judy did this and Judy did that. But they couldn't say, well, Judy did this because she found out that her husband hadn't paid the taxes for three years, and that's why she was broke. Or Judy did that because uh, her managers had embezzled $300,000, and um, 
she couldn't pursue that because she was working on her TV series and it would have been too much uh, unfavorable publicity. And I, again, she was, um, you know, we all have to take responsible for our own actions. I understand that. But she really, really tried so hard to get it right insofar as her business affairs, her personal affairs, uh, the trouble she had on and off with prescription medication. None of this was put into perspective uh, after she died. Because, again, the principal players, uh, you know, the, the fact that she married the wrong men again and again, uh, or trusted the wrong men again and again. Uh, it, it must have been very difficult for someone who was as intelligent in many ways as she was to keep picking herself off and starting over and then realizing that she had yet again made some of the same mistakes. And that's only human, and uh, it isn't a huge defense, but it's part of the perspective. And this is what was lacking from some of the, from many of the earlier books. I think, you know, the fact that the book I've do just done, the one we're discussing, Judy, A Legendary Film Career by John Fricke, Running Press, um, <laughs> is, is I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll, do, I'll do the plugs around here, Philip. Oh, all right, all right. Well, <laughs> you hadn't said anything. So. But I, I think that, you know, the, the book is, you know, aggressively a celebration of her film career, you know, and, and the good reviews and the bad reviews and all the rest of it. But you'll find that it's very difficult to write a, a negative book about Judy Garland if you're going to tell the truth. Hmm. And uh, this book kicks off with a 30-page biography that really does, um, I think, try to put stuff in perspective about her personal life. Uh, hmm. And again, it is only in the last five or ten years that all the principal players are now gone and you can talk more honestly about them than they ever talked about themselves mm -hmm. all right well uh let's take a let's take a quick break uh, this is bob andelman and you're listening to and <laughs> i forgot we're not doing video <laughs> <laughs> let me start that again be my guest <laughs> hopefully i'll catch it in the editing Let's take a quick break. Uh, this is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Interview with Judy Garland historian John Fricke, whose new book is Judy, A Legendary Film Career. And we'll be right back. You work too hard. Hi, this is Raquel Welch. Yes, that Raquel. And I'd rather stick needles in my ears than listen to one more minute of Mr. Media Radio. Ugh. Hey, folks. You can hear Mr. Media while on the go now with Stitcher Smart Radio. Stitcher is a free news and talk mobile app available for your smartphone, whether you use an iPhone, iPod Touch, Android, BlackBerry Curve, or Palm Pre. And when you download Stitcher to hear Mr. Media today, you have a chance to win some real money. Downloading is quick and easy. Just find Stitcher in your smartphone's app store. Download it. It's free. Take seconds. Then, during registration, hit the promo code box and enter Mr. Media, that's MR Media, to get automatically entered to win $100. The latest episode of Mr. Media will be waiting for you in Stitcher's favorites right on your phone. You'll get access to lots of other amazing shows, too. Always available to you on demand, no syncing. Some of my favorites include WTF with Mark Marin, Plus One Per Diem with Kevin Smith, and The Nerdist with Chris Hardwick. It's all free and all instant to you on Stitcher Smart Radio. And don't forget to win the money. Enter promo code Mr. Media, MR Media, when you register. And thanks for listening. This is Bob Andelman, and you're listening to the Mr. Media Interview with Judy Garland historian John Fricke, whose new book is Judy, A Legendary Film Career. Um, John, I was kind of curious. Uh, uh, you were talking about uh, you know people who are no longer with us, so you know the record is able to be cleared in some ways. But um, what about uh, Judy Garland's surviving family members in terms of – uh, are any of them have any of them helped you over the years with your research and, and the development? Oh, her daughter Lorna and her son Joe have helped many, many times. In fact, Lorna did the introduction to the 
book I did on Judy about eight years ago. And uh, that is a, a great compliment because the kids are very uh, protective of their mom. They went through it all with her, and yet their take on her is very much uh, a positive one. That, you know, that when things weren't good, they never felt they weren't loved. They never felt it had anything to do with them. It was just their mom trying to cope with all of the uh, pressures uh, that had been brought to bear on, on her life. And so it, to get uh, not so much validation from them, but, but because they don't have anything to say as far as what I can or can't write, but they appreciate the fact that I know... Uh, the information I know and that I kind of put it forth. And I think they appreciate the perspective more than anything else. And what about the daughter with the Z in her name? I I don't, you know, Liza has her own life and her own career and has never been, um, I see that she gets copies of whatever I do about her mom, but, Mm -hmm. you know, that's about the only uh, communication that has been necessary. Um, I I wondered about that because it, it was, you know, listen, she Judy had two famous daughters, one a little more famous than the other, uh, the way things worked out. And I noticed in the acknowledgments to this book that uh, Liza uh, Minnelli, for if there's anybody out there who doesn't know what we're talking about, um, not mentioned. And I thought, hmm. I mean, they- no, I, I, I don't, I don't bother Liza because there really isn't any need to. Hmm. You know that she has said what she is going to say, um, and. Uh, to ask her for more, I've, I've just never found it um, found it essential. If I were writing a book about the personal life, then it would be something else. But you know, this is about the the career, and um, they never made a movie together, mm. unless you want to count the last you know 15 seconds of In the Good Old Summertime. Nah, I don't count. <laughs> <laughs> well, so who is the family keeper of the flame? Is it is it Lorna or is there? Someone oh, definitely else? Lorna. Okay, uh, Lorna's the one who. Um, She's she's very, very sane, very stable, very well adjusted, uh, very clear eyed. Um, she also has been, uh, you know, as, as you mentioned, a success as a as a performer, and she's also been a, a, a success as a, a, a person, uh, as a mom. She has two really really beautiful children, uh, Jesse, who is now I believe twenty seven, and Vanessa, who is around uh, twenty, and. They're bright and attractive and down to earth and uh, proud of their parents. Again, very quiet about all this, but uh, very, very, very quietly proud. Hmm. And where are the? This is sort of what we were talking about before. But where are the landmines in writing about Judy Garland? I mean, in other words, you know, what is a little ticklish to cover for friends and family, even in doing a book, you know, about her films? Oh, I don't think anything is is ticklish at this point, unless you you know make just blatant. Uh, misstatements based on legend and myth as opposed to you know really doing the work and finding out the truth i think that um you know for for me in just doing this uh, apart from the family it's just you hear oh well this picture took so long to make and this picture took so long to make and this picture took so long to make yet if you actually go back and look you know you'll have people saying oh wizard of oz you know took two years or or uh summer stock took you know a year to make and it's like no these are these blatant um again self-aggrandizing comments by people who uh have their own access to grind and yet for example the one of the films one of the things we cover in the new book uh, there's a section called The Ones That Got Away, and it discusses five films that Judy started and didn't complete, one of which was the musical Royal Wedding with uh, Fred Astaire. And there's a quote in Stanley Donnan's biography, who directed that film, saying, we just couldn't get Judy to come in, meaning for rehearsals and things like that. Uh, you know, she, we, she wouldn't come in. And it's like, well, if you look at the production files for Royal Wedding at USC and the Arthur Freed Collection, Judy came in every day she was supposed to come in. She wasn't always on time, but she was there. And the people with whom she was working on her songs, Saul Chaplin and Johnny Green, you know, raved about the job she was doing. It, it's kind of like, fine, if she, you can say she was late, but don't say she didn't come in when she did on every scheduled day she was supposed to. <laughs> That's a little piece of the mosaic, but there are so many pieces like that. And it's important, you know, just, you, you, I don't, think it's fair for someone to work as hard and as well as she did and just be uh, printed as somebody who was, you know, lying around indulgently in the mansion for weeks at a time and wouldn't come to work. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Is it 
ha- have you found over the years of, of uh, uh, you know, kind of, uh, ri- well, writing about her and uh, capturing her, uh, that you've become more protective at this point of her and her legend than you were when you started? No, I've become more declarative about it. Okay. When when I started, I was, oh, well, maybe, you know, you've got to take all of this into account, and they said this, and, well, in the 25, 30, 40 years of research I've done, it is like, no, you have what you have to do on her behalf is clarify. And, you know, Stanley Donnan may say what he said, but you can't let it stand as the all-time permanent, all-encompassing record when the paperwork and the legal files show something different. You, you've got to balance it. And that isn't so much protective as it is just, hey, wait a minute, you know, put in the rest of the story. I don't mean to sound like Paul Harvey, but uh, <laughs> I think that that's important. Um, again, because knowing her, the arc of her life, as uh, some of us have come to know it, you see somebody who tried over and over and over and over to do the very, very best she could as much of the time as possible. And... Um, Nobody succeeds all the time, uh, nor did she. But she succeeded far, far more than um, some written history would have one believe. And when she didn't succeed, when she wasn't there, when she wasn't well, it's important to say why she wasn't Mm -hmm. or what were the extenuating circumstances. So I don't think that's so much protective as it is uh, perspective. Hmm. And And I have gotten to be more declarative about it. It's kind of like, look, fellas... Um, you know, tell, if, if you're going to tell anything, tell as much of the truth as you can, not just uh, one side of it. I think that segues to Irving Brecker, doesn't it? Ah, uh, Irving Brecker. I've heard of that man. Yes. <laughs> I will draw breath and let you talk occasionally. No, no, that's okay. Yeah, I had mentioned we during the break uh, that I had read this book, uh, The Wicked Wit of the West, uh, it was uh, Irving Brecker's uh, autobiography, and then it wound up uh, it, it, at the end. Uh, he had help from a, a writer named Hank Rosenfeld, and it's a fascinating book. Uh, Brecker wrote it in his uh, early 90s, um, which is amazing in and of itself. And uh, there's a section in here about um, Meet Me in St. Louis, which uh, I gather that uh, Brecker uh, wrote. He and uh, Freddie Finkelhoff co-wrote the sprint. Screenplay. Yeah, and he tells a story about how Judy did not want to do the movie, and uh, he got uh, brought he got brought in because he he and uh, so he claims in the book that he and Judy had been friends, and uh, that he was uh, encouraged to go and try to change her mind. And I guess he he actually I'm, I'm trying to find it while we've been talking uh, where he. Uh, uh, I guess he he read the script to her, and he downplayed uh, Margaret O'Brien's part in in his reading of the script, so that she would feel that hers was a a, a bigger part of it, uh, more important to it. Um, and he basically, I think, claims credit for getting her to make that movie. And I, I had kind of wondered if you were familiar with the. Uh, his uh, his book and his story about this. Well, I'm familiar with his claim because uh, we use a lot of audio quotes from him in the uh, commentary track of the Meet Me in St. Louis DVD. Hmm. Uh, They asked me to put that together, and I do the narration, but it segues in and out of quotes from, you know, audio quotes from Irving Brecker, from Margaret O'Brien, from Hugh Martin, the songwriter, people like that. Um, I I think, again, Irving is telling it from his point of view, and I think there's probably truth to it, but uh, for now, I will read you a quote from the new Judy, a legendary film career book uh, Uh that we've done. And it says, quote, history has made much of the fact that Judy didn't want to do Meet Me in St. Louis, feeling it would be a mistake to regress from her roles in For Me and My Gal and presenting Lily Mars to once again appear as a teenager. As an interlude, I can point out that that Judy was 21 years old when she made Meet Me in St. Louis and she was being asked again to play a 17-year-old. Right. Okay, the quote goes on to say, her dissatisfaction with Meet Me in St. Louis can be traced even more pointedly to the early meandering scripts for the film. Mm-hmm. As originally written, Esther Smith and her actions were alternately coy, simpering, or one-dimensional. And it's absolutely true. The early Meet Me in St. Louis scripts were, were dreadful, mm-hmm. and they involved all kinds of uh, extraneous subplots about Esther, Judy's character, being caught in the hotel room 
closet of Colonel Darley, with whom Judy was hoping to set up her older sister, not knowing that Colonel Darley was already married and he was going to sue the Smith family or his wife was going to... I mean, it just went on and on and on. And it was very girly-girly and very um, stupid, Mm -hmm. uh, those early scripts. And that is a great deal, has a great deal to do with why she didn't want to do the picture. Now, whether it was under Finkelhoff or Brecker that it was rewritten to become the very simple story it was, or... Brecker and Finkelhoff working under the guidance of Vincent Minnelli, who replaced George Cooper as the director of the film. Again, there are all of these pieces of the mosaic that you've got to factor in. All of them touched upon Judy's not wanting to do the picture and Judy's finally wanting to agree the picture, agree to do the picture. But uh, I don't think you can emphasize one over another. You have to kind of... Um, you can't make the cake unless you put in all the ingredients. <laughs> got it. Got it. I can't uh, believe I said that. <laughs> well, and okay, so I, I'm, I appreciate you touching on that, and I want to uh, steer us back around now to uh, the photos in this book, which we talked a little about before. Um, one of the things, that, one of the reasons I thought this book worked so well is because of its organization, which is chronological. But the photos, we can actually see uh, by you know because it's movie by movie by movie over the period of her film career. We can we can see her changing. We can see first the teenager morphing into the you know the, the young woman into the adult, and then you know before you know it, you're moving into you know God. Yes, Judy Garland had middle uh, middle age. Um, well, and especially in those days when middle age started, when you were 35 years old. Yeah. Um, it's just a. It's one of the things I really liked about it was because you did see this. This development, uh, I mean, you know, in my mind, it's all, she's pretty much always going to be the age of Dorothy Gale. And so when you see this, of course, you know, she was a, she was a woman. She was a real person. Well, and I think that's, uh, thank you for all of that, first of all. Second, I think that that's one point that the text of the book makes, too, in accompanying the pictures, is that, you know, through all those early years at Metro, as the, the perky teen, as the ingenue who put on the show with Mickey Rooney, as the young leading lady who was you know, chased by Gene Kelly and Fred Astaire, as the woman then who did A Star is Born and Judgment at Nuremberg and A Child is Waiting about a school for mentally challenged children. When she did her film, she didn't do many films in the 50s and 60s. In fact, there are only four across those two decades. But for two of them, she got Academy Award nominations, Star is Born and Judgment at Nuremberg. The other two, A Child is Waiting and I Could Go on Singing, um if not huge box office successes, were much more adult. All four of those films were much more adult than anything she did at MGM. So her career and her uh, acting challenges really evolved with the decades. She wasn't still playing Dorothy Gale when she was 40 Mm -hmm. in the film. She was playing uh, a a mother with an illegitimate son in one film uh, who happened to be an entertainer as well. Uh, she was playing, as I say, a teacher opposite a, a school head played by Burt Lancaster's in a Stanley Kramer, John Cassavetes movie about the challenges of, of uh, special needs children. Uh, it, again, Judgment at Nuremberg about uh, the judges who were being tried in Germany for cooperating with all the very Nazi, various Nazi plots and regimes. Uh, that's that's you jump from there back to Dorothy Gale, and you see why the film career she had is legendary and why she still uh, impacts. One of the things that was very apparent uh, in all the quotes that we use in the book from co-workers, producers, directors, makeup people, hair people, co-stars, uh, interviewers, is how real she always was on screen. Hmm. And that's why you can do a film festival in New York in the year 2011 and show films from the 30s and 40s where the plots themselves aren't especially believable, but she is very believable and pulls you right into the action. Uh, it's, it's, it's an amazing achievement, and there are, not, there are comparatively few stars of her generation who have that kind of impact yet today on an audience. Hmm. I'm not saying there aren't any. I'm just saying comparatively few. Right. I understand. Well, um, before we wrap up, I've I got to ask you, uh, as much time as you've spent studying Judy, writing about Judy, talking about Judy. Um, <clears throat> she's obviously held in very high esteem by film fans, but is there anything for which you think she is underappreciated or was in her time? 
Well, in her time, I think, again, she was so natural on the screen that she was never regarded as acting. You know, acting was something that Greer and Betty and Joan did. Um, you know, Judy, Judy was just Judy. But it turns out that there's absolutely nothing affected about it. There's nothing over the top about it. Uh, it's just all of this um, sincerity and vulnerability. Now, those were the traits she had as a human being and that ultimately worked against her because the last thing you can be in show business is sincere and vulnerable. If you want to last, uh, you get, uh, I think, trampled as mm. a result. But um, I think that certainly history has proven the, the truth of every rave she got in films between 1936 and 1963. Hmm. And the fact that uh, they're still being shown and enjoyed and still having the impact as I said, I'll be going to an Oz Festival, uh, a couple of them over the next few weeks, and there will be literally hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little girls in blue and white dresses and red shoes. And I've been doing these Oz Festivals since the 50th anniversary of the film in 1989, when there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of little girls dressed that way. And I remember thinking 22 years ago, this has got to be the peak. It can't get bigger than this. It can't sustain this. Well, bingo, here we are, and it not only has, but the little girls I'll be seeing in the next couple of weeks, are more or less the daughters of the ones I saw 22 years ago. <laughs> and I think that is a, a lovely thing. So much of my email comes from teenagers around the world saying, we have just seen Judy Garland in such and such. Where can we see more? Or we heard her sing you, uh, Old Man River on YouTube. Wow. Uh, or Battle Him of the Republic, or As Long As He Needs Me, or material from her TV series. It, ju it just doesn't go away because... There were very few people like her. There are fewer people like her today mm -hmm. with that kind of, you know, who's standing there singing live, not uh, surrounded by snakes and flash powder and, <laughs> you know, all of that kind of stuff. There's room for all of it. Right. But I think the, what makes her film career and her entire career as legendary as it is is the fact that you got all of that talent and all of that communication neat, as it were. And that's a, a very rare thing. You're getting a sense of the person and of the, as you said at the beginning, the God-given gifts. Well, uh, John, is there a next book already lined up? Are you working on... Not, no, right now I'm working on a nap. Um, <laughs> I think, I think uh, we've got the 75th anniversary of the Wizard of Oz movie coming up in 2014. There will mm -hmm. certainly be projects uh, connected to that with which I hope I can be involved. I would love to do a companion book to this one, that would give the same kind of detail about her TV stage uh, recording and um, radio work, mm -hmm. because uh, then you'd have another great, he said hopefully great volume, that um, has that history in it for, for access. Uh, the radio but work it all depends great. what they're buying. Yeah, I, I, I've heard, I'm, uh, my, my wife and my daughter and I are all big fans of old radio uh, stuff from the 30s and 40s, and uh, a lot of the stuff she did, in the, in, especially the, the comedies, where she would, you know, be with Bob Hope or Jack Benny or wh whoever she was on with, you know, she was very funny, and she had a very good handle on what what worked for her in that medium. She was always Well, and again, not afraid to ad-lib, you know, it was all scripted, but yep. uh, Bing Crosby is on record as saying that she was the most talented person with ever, with, uh, of anybody with whom he worked, and they never got to do TV or, or film, but they did hours and hours on radio, and she was just his favorite, because she was funny, she was musical, uh, she did dialects, she did hillbilly and, and western and all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, again, there's, there's a facet of her talent that maybe people don't know. Well, uh, folks, listen, you can uh, order Judy Garland historian John Fricke's fascinating new book, Judy, A Legendary Film Career, in great bookstores everywhere, or order it right now at a great price at mrmedia.com. And, John, uh, do you have a, a website? Uh, are you on any social media where people can find you? No, I'm just, my email is just johnfricke at aol.com. And uh, uh, Facebook, I, I owe about 250 emails by actual count right now, so I'm not looking to go to Twitter or Twitter or Facebook or, you know, anything like that. Uh, it, it's nice to think that I might be well-received if I did, but I'll, I'll handle it as best I can, just uh, <laughs> the old-fashioned email kind of way. Got it. Got it. Well, uh, John Fricke, it's a, it's a beautiful book, a uh, fascinating look at uh, someone I think most people think they already know a lot about, but they have a lot to learn, apparently. And um, thank you so much for joining us on Mr. Media today. 
Well, thank you for the forum. These were great questions, and um, I I love to talk about this, and it's nice to talk about it um, in this depth as opposed to, what is your favorite Judy Garland song, Mr. Frick? <laughs> so um, I appreciate all of that, too. <laughs> My pleasure. It was, it was just very nice to talk to you today. Anytime at all, Bob. Thank you. All right. Thank you, and continued good luck. Thanks. All right. For more original interviews, surf over to our main website, mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. If you've enjoyed today's show, subscribe for free to Mr. Media via email, RSS, or iTunes, and you'll never miss a show. Another good idea? Download our new free Mr. Media mobile app in the Android market. You can also listen with a piece of string and a tin can in many parts of the Internet. Show your support of Mr. Media by supporting our sponsors, including Audible. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com slash radio. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash radio for your free audiobook. We're also supported by the thepartyauthority.us. Call DJ Ira for all your party entertainment needs nationwide at 1-800-DIAL-DJs or visit their website, thepartyauthority.us. If you've got an idea for a guest, a comment on today's show, or would like to advertise on Mr. Media Radio, email me directly at bob at mrmedia.com, mrmedia.com. You can also call our 24-hour listener line at 1-727-498-4711. Some messages may be used in an upcoming show. And unless you live next door to Mr. Media, there may be a toll charge. You can also follow Mr. Media on Facebook, Twitter, or our new YouTube and Vimeo video channels. Thanks so much for joining us today. I always appreciate you sharing a piece of your day with Mr. Media. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching.